I'm Alex Toby, this is XDA TV, and this is the Nexus 4, 10 years on from its launch in the winter of 2012. It arrived as smartphone growth was exploding and 4G LTE was being rolled out around the world. Every Android generation bought faster processors, more RAM, more storage, and higher camera specs. And the churn through those generations was faster than ever, with new upgrades coming all the time. If, like me, you used an Nexus 4 in 2012, you'll probably have some fond memories of this slick, glittery early 2010s powerhouse. But even if you didn't, you'll also want to keep watching because there's more to this decade-old little Google phone than you might think. So take a sec to subscribe so you don't miss more retro coverage like this, and we'll jump into the story of the LG Nexus 4. Google's Nexus program started out as a way to showcase each year's new Android software version with a co-branded phone created with one of its manufacturer partners. Nexus ran stock Android and got software updates first, making it the phone of choice for Android nerds and software purists. But in 2012, Google flipped the script with Nexus tablets in two sizes and a unique but ultimately abandoned streaming device, RIP Nexus Q. The point is, Nexus was becoming a bit more like a conventional tech brand as opposed to just a yearly phone release for enthusiasts and app developers. That process began in earnest with the Nexus 7 tablet earlier in 2012. For the time, it was fairly powerful, boasting a 7-inch screen, an NVIDIA Tegra processor geared towards graphics, and most important of all, a price of just $199. This cheap and cheerful trend continued with the Nexus phone for 2012, made in partnership with LG. The Nexus 4 sold for just $299 in the US and £239 here in the UK. That's less than half the price of its predecessor, 2011 Samsung Galaxy Nexus, and it featured for the time really top-tier specs, the only notable absence being 4G LTE, which was still pretty niche in most parts of the world, and the fairly small 8GB of storage in the base model, though there was also a 16GB version with a slightly higher price tag. This was basically Google doing the early OnePlus strategy before OnePlus even existed. Top specs, cheap price, direct sales. The Nexus 4 was sold directly via Google's online store with no carrier involvement. And there was only one version of the phone sold internationally with the model number LG E960. This was good for 3G connectivity on any HSPA network thanks to traveler-friendly pentaband radios. And for a while it had a hidden feature that could unlock even faster data speeds. We'll get to that a bit later. It was a marked break from what Google had attempted with the previous Galaxy Nexus, which was sold as a 4G LTE exclusive on Verizon in the US. The GNX was critically praised and a genuinely great phone for the time, but it had been a sales flop. Even Samsung itself described sales as minuscule in court statements during its legal fight with Apple, apparently contributing just $215 million in revenue. And so for Nexus, it was time for a change in strategy. But let's back up a bit and look at what the deal actually is with a Nexus. Why would LG or any of the big Android brands for that matter want to make one when you're looking at sales based on the Samsung numbers of maybe a million units if you're lucky? Sure, there's a little bit of nerd cred and brand value that comes with making a Nexus, but mainly it's about boosting your relationship with Google, which hopefully would lead to better products. Back then, if you were a Nexus partner, you got to see the new version of Android as Google was building it, giving our engineers a head start and potentially speeding up software updates for other phones. Things have changed a lot in this area since the days of the Nexus, though. In 2022, of course, there's no Nexus, and every major phone maker gets privileged early access to the Android code as Google's building it, even before the developer previews and public betas. But a decade ago there were real incentives, both direct and indirect, to making these Nexus devices. From speaking with one source recently, though, it also seems like LG was just the only manufacturer that was able to produce the Nexus 4 at the price that Google wanted. Google decided pretty early on that it wanted to price the phone very aggressively, which influenced their decisions from the very beginning. Interestingly, that's the same reason Google chose LG to make the Pixel 2 XL many years later, as opposed to the originally planned HTC version of that phone. For more of a deep dive on the Pixel line, you want to check out our big Pixel history video linked somewhere up here. Anyway, LG was no stranger to smartphones, but its early Android efforts hadn't been anywhere near as successful as local rival Samsung's Galaxy S line. So the partnership with Google could have also been seen as a way to raise its profile in the Android world. The Nexus 4 coincided with and was loosely based on the LG Optimus G. That's the phone that kicked off the LG G series that stuck around almost until LG stopped making smartphones altogether. The Optimus G shared many of the same internal specs and one of the Nexus's key design elements, the crystal reflective pattern on its glass back. Pretty much every phone has a glass back today, but back then it was still pretty unusual to stick glass on the back of an Android phone, and the crystal reflective pattern took advantage of that material's slick appearance to populate the back panel with a shimmering star 
are filled with tiny notches. Stick a macro lens in front of this and you can see the individual cuts on the underside of the glass that give it this look. The other thing about glass, unlike metal, is it lets you do wireless charging. This was something that was still pretty novel for 2012. Some of Samsung's phones like the Galaxy S3 and S4 were capable of charging over the Qi standard, but only with the addition of ugly, bulky aftermarket battery doors. The Nexus had it out of the box. Honestly, the build quality of this phone holds up even in 2022. Sure, you gotta deal with 2012 era top and bottom screen bezels, but the reflective trim looks sharp, and I appreciate the small touches like the curved edges to the glass here. What definitely doesn't hold up is this rubberized grip on the outside. Here's the thing about rubbery bits on phones after a decade. They basically start to decompose. Yeah, this Nexus 4 is rotting, kind of. This is a process called rubber reversion, the material reverting back to its natural, more viscous form. It's non-reversible, you can scrape the sticky layer of rubber off the top, but eventually the whole thing is gonna revert. As you can imagine, it's pretty gross, a texture and consistency somewhere between chewing gum and blue tack, and it's a nightmare for picking up dust or hairs or anything of that sort. This is my personal Nexus 4 from a decade ago, purchased on launch day in November 2012. It spent most of that decade in a drawer, but with enough time this reversion will happen to any rubber gadget. But there is a solution. Somehow, brand new white Nexus 4 backs are still occasionally available to buy on eBay, so I picked one up. The difference with the white one is the sidewalls are made of plain old matte polycarbonate, or plastic to you and me, so there's no rubber reversion to worry about. Also fortunate, the back of the Nexus 4 is shockingly easy to repair. Basically the only thing holding this back on are these two Torx T5 screws and some plastic clips which you can easily jimmy out the way. And so with a bit of elbow grease I could very easily swap my gross decomposing black Nexus 4 back with a brand new white one. These white Nexus 4s launched much later into the phone's lifespan, so they were quite rare back in the day, and even more so now. And there are two tiny but important additions between my original November 2012 back panel and this more recent version. These tiny nubs down here were added to later revision Nexus 4s to address a common problem with this phone. The back of this device was glass, and there's no camera bump, so put it on a flat surface and there's little to no friction to hold it in place. As a result, a lot of early Nexus 4 owners complained of phones slowly sliding off surfaces and countertops, and because the phone was glass on both sides, such a fall was almost certain to be fatal if the Nexus landed on a flat surface after its tumble. These tiny nubs were just enough to stop the phone going walkabout. As well as the latest Snapdragon S4 Pro, the first quad-core chip from Qualcomm, the Nexus boasted a very generous 2GB of RAM, and the extra power of that chip, plus plenty of memory, made the Nexus 4 the fastest Android phone you could buy in late 2012. This thing absolutely flew on the new Android 4.2 Jelly Bean, and was a uniquely powerful phone considering its price. There were a few hardware compromises though, battery life was middling at best, and the display was a very average 720p LCD, which was pretty dim most of the time and lacked some of the punch of Samsung's OLED. Colours on the Nexus 4's display weren't anywhere near as vibrant as the Galaxy Nexus's HD Super AMOLED. And the Nexus was an also-ran when it came to photography as well. Even by the standards of the time, this 8 megapixel shooter produced dull-looking shots with poor dynamic range, so it was advisable to hop into the new HDR mode if you want a more usable snaps. You can see here just how far we've come in a decade. In 2012, Android phones didn't have the larger sensors, the computational photography, or the optical stabilization that today's flagships rely on. One new addition that did turn a few heads and was genuinely impressive for the time was Photosphere. New on the Nexus 4 and shipped on every Google phone since, this lets you create your own 360 degree photo by scanning the world around you, similar to the way Google Street View works. Then just like panorama mode, the Google camera stitches the images together into a sphere of photos. This definitely works best with a lot of distant terrain, as opposed to scenes with a lot of stuff in the foreground. Nevertheless, in the few months that I used the Nexus 4 in 2012 and 2013, I did manage to shoot a few impressive photospheres that still hold up today. Android fans would have to wait another generation for the Nexus 5 to bring the first iteration of HDR+. That's the technology that eventually birthed the Google Pixel camera revolution. Aside from photosphere, imaging on the Nexus 4 seemed like a bit of an afterthought. <laughs> Android 4.2 Jelly Bean, which the Nexus 4 shipped with, wasn't a huge update. Earlier in 2012 though, Google had launched Android 4.1, which actually was a very big deal. 4.1 brought big performance improvements as Google went to war on the lag and frame dropping that pervaded many Android phones. 4.2 just tightened things up a bit and added a couple of new features. 
The most interesting of these is the one that was unceremoniously dumped later, lock screen widgets. We're just now revisiting this on iOS with Apple's always on display on the iPhone 14 Pro, but Android was doing it a decade ago, albeit in a slightly different way. Lock screen widgets on the Nexus 4 essentially gave you a bunch of extra widget panels on your lock screen. You could add regular Android widgets here and they'd expand to fill the full screen area or contract up to the top if they were your primary lock screen. This implementation wasn't perfect because not every widget was designed to fit such a large space, but there were some great examples like Dash Clock, which populated this space with useful information like emails, battery levels, and weather alerts in a way that's shockingly quite similar to the way I have my iPhone 14 Pro configured a decade on. There was a catch though. If you used a pattern or pin on your phone, lock screen widgets wouldn't work for pretty obvious reasons. And since we were still years off Android phones having biometric security, this was a hard choice between security and convenience. Perhaps this had to do with why this feature ultimately didn't last very long. The Nexus 4's lifespan straddled the big change from the Android 4 to Android 5 design language, from hollow to material design. When Android 4.0 Ice Cream Sandwich launched in 2011, it introduced this sci-fi looking hollow aesthetic with a prominent blue accent throughout. This was then dialed back to the more neutral looking Android 4.4 KitKat before being completely overhauled with 5.0 Lollipop. The origins of the current Google and Android design language can be traced back to Material Design 1.0 in 2014, built around the concept of digital paper, a magical digital canvas which could expand as needed with depth and shadows and plenty of punchy, more vibrant colours. The Nexus 4 is one of the only phones of this era to be updated with the full Material Design look and feel. Back then, Android phones were lucky to get one year of platform updates, let alone the luxury of the two that Nexus phones offered, and so the Nexus 4 was officially put out to pasture on Android 5.1.1 in April 2015. On paper, the Nexus 4 was a 3G-only device, and you'd expect as much in 2012 for the price. But it turned out that with some hacking, you could tap into hidden 4G LTE capabilities within this phone. This was first discovered back in November 2012 by one enterprising XDA forums user, and it turned out the trick to enable it was actually fairly simple. Enter Android's hidden info menu by entering a code in the dialer, select LTE as your radio option, and then change your APN, basically the configuration info that your phone sends to your carrier. A deep dive by the legendary Anantec later showed the phone supported 4G on at least three US radio bands with sufficient tinkering, pointing to potential AT&T LTE support in the US. This apparently unintended feature was quickly pulled from the Nexus's firmware by Google, not least because the phone wasn't certified to use LTE in the US or any other country, meaning it was technically illegal to use the phone in this way. There was a lot of back and forth online at the time about the potential reason for this vestigial 4G capability being left behind in the Nexus 4. The Snapdragon S4 Pro chip supported LTE and LG's own Optimus G, which we talked about before, was a full-blown 4G phone. So it's possible it was just easier for Google and LG to include all the necessary hardware and then leave it disabled in software, economies of scale and all that. Whatever the case, the fact that the hardware technically supported it allowed brave Nexus 4 owners to continue adding 4G back into this phone via custom radio firmware all the way through until Android Lollipop. The Nexus 4 was critically praised for its high performance, low price and clean stock Android OS, but once again the camera was an afterthought and the lack of 4G LTE, at least officially, was a turn off for many in the US where LTE had been a thing for almost two years already. Nevertheless, demand for the Nexus 4 was huge. Google's online store crumbled under launch day pressure and supply issues made the phone hard to come by until the early part of 2013. The reason, according to interviews with LG execs at the time, was that Google had set Nexus 4 production levels to match the demand of the previous Nexus, the poorly selling Samsung Galaxy Nexus. Demand for the Nexus 4 was 10 times higher, all of which led to LG scrambling to ramp up production while local executives simultaneously apologized to customers and pointed the finger at Google. So what can you do with a Nexus 4 today? Well, it's a Nexus, so unlocking the bootloader is easy and there's no shortage of custom ROMs to take the phone far beyond its official resting place of Android 5.1.1. Like a lot of older Android phones though, there are a few extra hoops to jump through. First, you've got to repartition the phone to make room for newer, larger versions of Android. Basically involves redistributing the internal storage so the area reserved for the OS is larger. Fortunately, the guys on the XDA forums have made this process pretty easy. Essentially, it's just the same as flashing a custom firmware. So then, after repartitioning, the Nexus 4 is ready to fire up Android 11 through Lineage OS 18.1. Lineage is the successor to CyanogenMod, which was a popular custom ROM in the early Android days. 
So this two-year-old OS works surprisingly well on this 10-year-old phone. It's arguably a bit less smooth than say Android KitKat or Lollipop, but what you lose in performance you gain in app compatibility. And it's definitely more usable than many other phones of this era on modern versions of Android. Case in point, the Samsung Galaxy S3 here, which really struggles on Android 12. But where the Nexus 4 hits a roadblock is with its limited internal storage, especially the 8GB version that I have here. Repartitioning gives you more room for the OS, but at the cost of the storage space reserved for apps and other data. As such, installing Google Apps on here is a no-go, which seriously hampers what you can do with this phone. Still, as a tech demo, it's impressive to have this relatively up-to-date version of Android running on hardware from a decade ago. And this phone would still work perfectly fine for things like very basic gaming, web browsing, or music playback. Of all the phones of 2012, the Nexus 4 has probably held up the best, thanks to the efforts of the custom ROM community. And sidestepping that rubber aversion, the hardware still looks and feels decent today, especially considering how cheap it was at launch. The whole idea of powerful, affordable Nexuses would stick around for another generation or so after this. The LG Nexus 5 in 2013 brought a bigger and better screen, higher end specs, and a better camera for $50 more, but Google would soon return to more traditional flagship pricing with the Nexus 6 and 6P. This is the kind of phone that could only really exist in the mid-2010s, in the glory days where you really could get the best Android specs for under $300. The smartphones of the early 2020s are much more complex, with things like 5G, 120Hz screens, and multiple cameras pushing up that bill of materials. It really is a different era in smartphone history. If you used a Nexus 4 back in the day, or maybe you still have one, then hit the comments and share your memories. Stick with us and subscribe to XDA TV for more retro reviews like this one. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.